Welcome back to the Dirt Show. Plenty of bad news since we were on last Wednesday. The situation in Ukraine may be getting a little better for the people of Kiev and for the people of Lviv and for some others in the east, um, and uh, they're getting worse in the east. Um, uh, the news out of Maripol is just just horrendous. The attack on the uh, train, uh, which was carrying uh, refugees who wanted to go from the dangerous east to the somewhat less dangerous west, was an obvious, horrible uh, war crime, deserving uh, the, since the most serious uh, uh, penalties. Um, and it looks like it only is going to get worse uh, as uh, Putin and his generals, his new general, the butcher of Syria, um, insist on trying to annex uh, large parts of the east and the south in order to build a land bridge, basically, from Russia to uh, to uh, Crimea and to landlock uh, Ukraine. Um, these are all terrible, terrible uh, tactics and, and, and war crimes. But today, I want to talk to you one more time about the crime of genocide, um, the attack on the bus carrying civilians with um, many, many killed, many, many wounded, and the rocket that apparently, I think it's been confirmed, but I'm not sure, uh, carried in Russian and Ukrainian the words for the children, for the children, a rocket aimed at children has raised in the minds of many um, the possibility that Putin is now engaged in, in genocide. Uh, so far, the Biden administration has said, not yet. Um, most European leaders have said, not yet. Um, my view is not at all that uh, the crime of genocide is not different only in degree from what's going on, the horrible war crimes that are going on in Ukraine, but it's different in, in, in kind. And, and let me try to illustrate that by um, imagining the following scenario. Just imagine the following scenario. A 16-year-old girl um, named, um, we'll call her, Maria Kostopoulos. She's working as an apprentice to a dressmaker on the island of Rhodes. You know, that's an island uh, in the Aegean um, that uh, is associated with Greece, obviously. Uh, and this is 1944. Um, the Nazis have invaded Greece. Mussolini used to be there. Now the Nazis are there in, in Greece in 1944. Maria is a very religious um, Christian, uh, Eastern Orthodox Church. She's on her way to the church for Easter, um, where she sings religious songs in the, in the choir. She doesn't have any Jewish friends uh, or any Jewish relatives. She has no association with the Jews of, of Rhodes, uh, who have been there, by the way, since the Babylonian exile. They've been there for, what, 2,500 or more years. But she has no relationship with them. She is part of the, of the Greek Orthodox Jewish, um, Greek Orthodox Christian community. But suddenly, on the way to uh, church, the Gestapo arrests her and her father, but not her mother, just her, she's an only child, and her, her father, not her mother, um, and uh, accuses them of a horrible crime that is being Jewish. That's the crime. Her father's father, it turns out, unbeknownst to any of these people, who's now been dead a long time, her paternal grandfather was a Jew before his family converted to Greek Orthodoxy when he was two years old. And they never told him about his Jewish heritage. So suddenly the 16-year-old seamstress um, is arrested with her father for being, for being Jews. The Gestapo, when they came to Rhodes, went through 100 years of birth records, the road 
Roads community kept birth records, hospital records, birth records, religious uh, records, um, going back a hundred years and determined that Maria and her father were, quote, genetically Jewish, according to Nazi racial characterizations. Uh, they were immediately, without being able to say goodbye to family or anybody else, immediately put on a ferry. Uh, the ferry then went to a train. They were put in a cattle car. Uh, the train took three days to get from the Greek mainland um, to uh, Auschwitz. Uh, four days later, um, Maria was separated out from her father. Her father was taken to a gas chamber and murdered, and Maria was turned into a prostitute for the Reich um, with a sign tattooed on her arm that she was reserved to have sex for the commandant and other members of the guard group at Auschwitz. She served as a prostitute for the Reich for three months at the age of 16, and then she was sent to the gas chambers and her body was, was cremated. There were many such Marias uh, from 1941 to 1945, uh, and they included nuns, they included priests, they included anyone, no matter what your occupation was. If you had a Jewish grandparent, there were some exceptions made. Gertrude Stein was allowed to live in peace because she collaborated with the Gestapo, so you could make deals with the devil perhaps if you were prominent uh, enough. But for the ordinary person, the 16-year-old seamstress, the nun or the priest um, in a parish, there were no defenses. If your grandfather or grandmother was Jewish, you were dead. You were part of the extermination. Why do I tell this story? Because that is genocide. That was the Holocaust, the systematic attempt to exterminate every person in the world with Jewish genetic makeup, regardless of the religion they practiced, regardless of their nationality, regardless of what language they spoke, regardless of their occupation, regardless of their politics, or any other personal characteristics no matter where they live, no matter how far they were from the war or from the land that the Nazis wanted to clear for German expansion, if you were a genetic Jew, you were targeted for extermination. As Elie Wiesel put it, not every victim was a Jew, but every Jew was a victim. Now, the most important thing to remember is that the genocide against the Jews was not part of a war effort. Uh, to the contrary, it was inconsistent with the military goals of the war. Thousands of soldiers were diverted from the fight against the Russians in the East, the attempt to prevent the landing at Normandy, the invasion of of Berlin, uh, the liberation of Paris, thousands of soldiers were diverted away from those war activities and made to just kill Jews, kill Jews. There was the Holocaust by bullets, um, where people like the 30,000 or so in Babi Yar were lined up in front of a ravine and just killed by machine guns by bullets. And there was the Holocaust by gas chambers. There was the Holocaust by mobile gas vans. They would come from town to town, identify who was of Jewish genetic origin, and murder them. Uh, that was the way it worked. Including among those who were murdered were Jewish scientists who could have helped Germany win the war by helping to develop or win the race for the development of the atomic bomb. Um, obviously, most famous among them was Einstein. I don't know if he would have helped make, develop the atomic bomb, probably not, but there were many other Jews, much lower-ranking Jews, who could have helped. Uh, remember that 
Jews were very patriotic in Germany. They served with great distinction in the First World War against the United States. They were German patriots. And these were people who probably would have helped in the war effort if there weren't a separate war going on at the same time, the war to exterminate uh, the Jews. Um, implementing the Nazi Holocaust, uh, an entirely separate and often incompatible goal, was as important to pre than prevailing on the battlefield. Um, when Hitler and, 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 and Goebbels uh, committed suicide at the end of the war, they knew that they had lost the military battle, but they also knew that they had achieved a very substantial victory in their war against the Jewish race. Why do I tell this terrible, terrible story? I tell this story uh, because that was the Holocaust, including my own family. Uh, when I went to Poland recently, I discovered that there was a 16-year-old in my family, uh, a young girl, apparently very beautiful, who lived in a small town uh, that was 30 or 40 miles away from Krakow, where my family came from. And she was made a prostitute for the Reich and then murdered. Her 15-year-old brother uh, was hanged um, in, in Auschwitz, not even, not even gassed, after working for the commandant. Apparently, he did something the commandant didn't like. Um, so let's compare this actual genocide. Uh, remember, the very term genocide was coined by a Polish lawyer to describe the Nazi campaign to exterminate every Jew in the world. Uh, l let's compare that to Vladimir Putin's horrible war against uh, Ukraine and the criminal tactics, war crimes, no doubt, criminal tactics that he and his generals are currently employing in, in order to achieve their goals. Let's begin with, with what Putin's actual goals were and are when he ordered the invasion of Ukraine. His primary goals was first to um, replace the Zelensky government, which he perceived of as being anti-Russian, with a pro-Russian regime. The predecessor regime had been pro-Russian. And to rule from the Kremlin over the Ukrainian people, a common goal for tyrants. Hitler had the same goal militarily when he invaded Poland and Czechoslovakia and then ultimately France and Belgium and all of those places, and he succeeded at least temporarily in those goals. Another of his goals was to annex the eastern parts of Ukraine in order to build that land bridge between Russia and um, Crimea and to turn Ukraine into a landlocked country rather than one that has access to various warm water ports, uh, which, which they do now, at least for the moment. So those were his goals. What were his means? The means of achieving those goals, there are many ways you could achieve those goals. You could assassinate the Zelensky. They tried to do that through Chechen assassins. They failed. Um, you could try to do that diplomatically, the way, for example, uh, Hitler did it with uh, Czechoslovakia. He managed to get Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland particularly, without firing a shot. You could try to do all that, but that's not what Putin did. Putin decided to engage in an aggressive military war against an innocent country, which in and of itself is a war crime. So that was one of the means toward taking over Ukraine. And the means of winning that war, that ferocious war, against what he believed was a militarily weak Ukrainian army was, and this is the important point, to demoralize the civilian population by causing enormous number of civilian deaths, including among children. Both the ends and the means 
are war crimes. It's war crime to wage aggressive war. It's a war crime to target civilians, even if the purpose of the targeting is to demoralize them in order to achieve a military victory. That's a war crime. But it's not genocide. That's the key difference. It's a military campaign using illegal means to achieve both a military and a political result. Genocide, on the other hand, requires a plan to exterminate a racial, religious, tribal, ethnic, linguistic, or genetic group, a group of people who are identified in this kind of either genetic or genetic-like manner. It is different in kind from what Putin is doing. The Ukrainians are similar to the Russians in all the above respects. They are all Slavs. They are mostly Eastern Orthodox by religion. They speak similar languages, and many Ukrainians are bilingual and speak Russian, particularly um, in, 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 in the East. They eat the same food. They enjoy the same music. And they share a common heritage and history there are, of course, very important differences, and we're seeing them play out right now. Ukraine is a separate nation with a high degree of nationalism, as evidenced by the enormous resistance that it's putting up to trying to be taken over by uh, Russia. But, and a lot can be said about Putin's war crimes, and should be said, and hopefully will be said, in the International Criminal Court in The Hague or some special court that's set up to assess and prosecute Putin's war crimes. But the one thing they are not is genocide. And that is crystal clear. And it's not that it's not yet genocide, as Jake Sullivan, the American National Security Advisor said, Jake's a very bright guy. He's just wrong about that. It's not that it's not yet genocide. It's simply not genocide. It's not part of a genocidal plot. It's not that if they call, kill more civilians, it will become genocide. It's never going to be genocide because genocide is a completely different crime. They just don't come within the definition of genocide. Genocidal armies don't allow four million people to escape and become refugees. You think a single Jew was ever allowed out of Germany or out of Poland or out of Rhodes where Maria lived? Of course not. The goal was not to get rid of them by having them emigrate to Palestine or America or uh, a neutral country like Turkey or Spain. It was to keep them in. It was to put them in, what do you call them? Concentration camps. To concentrate them in one place so they can be systematically murdered. Genocidal regimes don't engage in prisoner exchanges. They kill every person, prisoner or not, who is part of the genetic group who is being targeted by the genocide. Uh, if it was genocide, it would have tried to exempt the millions of ethnics and linguistic Russians who live in eastern Ukraine and who have suffered among the most horrendous brutalities. Uh, remember that when Germany did what it did, it went to Czechoslovakia. It didn't kill the Czechs. It killed the Jews in Czechoslovakia. It embraced the ethnic Germans who lived in Sudetenland, which was part of Czechoslovakia. That's the difference between genocide and other war crimes. And it's crucially important to keep separate, to keep separate war crimes that involve the killing of civilians as a means toward achieving a military victory, even aggressive war, targeting civilians. It's crucially important to separate that out from the very different crime of genocide. The memory of the Holocaust and the memory of the handful of other genocides, there have only been a handful in, in modern history that occurred in the 20th century, 
obviously the Turkish policy to exterminate Armenian Christians. This was a Muslim government's attempt to exterminate Armenian Christians was a genocide. It took a long time for the world to recognize that, but Hitler recognized it. He said, nobody cares about what the Turks did to the Armenians and nobody will care what we do to the Jews. There was genocide that occurred in parts of Africa where one tribal group tried to eliminate another tribal group. But it is absolutely important that these real genocides not be diluted, not be diminished by other crimes. You know, it's so understandable that we want to use the worst words we can against Putin and his generals, and we should. But words mean something. History means something. And it's really, really important not to forget history and not to dilute the meaning of historical events. Speaking of history, what the Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada said the other day is just unbelievable. He was on uh, an American uh, TV show, and he was asked, how come there are so many Ukrainians in uh, Canada? And here was his answer. Canada has always welcomed refugees. Now, let me tell you the truth, Mr. Trudeau. There's a book written by a very prominent uh, professor uh, in Canada uh, named Abella. And the name of the book is Even One is Too Many. Where does that title come from, Even One is Too Many? The Minister of Absorption of Canada during the Holocaust was asked to accept a handful of Jews as refugees. And what did he say? Even one is too many. Canada was among the worst countries in the world in refusing to accept Jews. Among the worst it didn't accept Jews. What it accepted was Nazi war criminals. When the war was over, many Ukrainians tried to flee Ukraine because they were wanted for war crimes. Yes, Ukrainians were wanted for war crimes, and Canada opened its arms to them, said we need farmers. And so it brought tens of thousands of Ukrainians, including many war criminals, just a few years after it refused to accept a single Jew. So, Mr. Trudeau, I knew your father. He was an honest man. You are not. And you should stop lying about Canada's history because Canada's history about accepting refugees is despicable. It's among the worst in the world. And I invite you to come and answer on this show. Maybe you don't remember. Maybe you're not well educated. Maybe you just don't know. But now you know. Now you know that Canada was among the worst countries in the world in accepting Jewish immigrants and opened its arms to Nazi war criminals much more even than the United States did. So shame on you, Mr. Trudeau. Shame on Canada. Shame on those who engaged in a double standard in keeping Jews out and welcoming Ukrainian Nazi war criminals. Sorry if I seem angry, but nothing gets me angrier than somebody who I agree with generally. Um, as, I, as I told you, I knew Trudeau's father. I worked with him uh, in 1970. I, I liked his, his father uh, very much, but, but I cannot abide rewriting history and turning the worst country, one of the worst countries in the world, into the best country that welcomed refugees. No, no, no. You're not going to get away with that as long as I'm around to correct you. OK, if any of you are rushing from Canada, I'd be very interested in your reactions to my tirade against uh, Trudeau and against his attempt to distort the history. Okay, let's get to Q&A questions and, uh, and answers. Oh, the questions continue. The questions continue. Here's one from uh, Jailbreak71. I'm only going to read a few of these because they're such, such nonsense, but you have to know what people are thinking before you can respond to them. Mostly I'll get to intelligent comments, but let's start with the unintelligent comments. Uh, Russia is handing out food and meds to the people of Ukraine. Of course we know that. 
The media is planting fake dead bodies. The media is planting fake dead bodies in the streets to manipulate the people with help from Brandon's Pentagon because they got caught with bio facilities, FK, U.S. puppet Zelensky, the actor, we are being invalidated in the southern border, and that is what we should be focusing on. Stop watching the propaganda news. No, no, no. Stop listening to idiots like you. Yes, I'm going to read stuff from people like you because we have to know that there are people out there, and so many of them, hundreds that I got, who don't care about the truth. Next one, Hunter's Son 7. The problem is that the massacre appears to have been Ukrainians killing Ukrainians. I'm sure that's, that's obvious. Uh, Ukrainians just go around killing Ukrainian children and sending rockets that say this is for the children. Of course, that's, that's true. Um, and then we always get the anti-Semitic angle to this. There's no news event that doesn't have an anti-Semitic angle. When I talk about baseball and the, the Yankees versus the the Red Sox, I get anti-Semitic, I get anti-Semitic mail. So here, the censorship is ramped up pretty bad. The kikes must be running the show now. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't even know what the word kike meant, but apparently it's a, a nasty reference to, to Jews. And then somebody responds, a liberal, not all Jews agree with Zuckerberg and shifts of the world. And then the answer, but unfortunately the Zionists do. Exactly, exactly. It's the Zionists. If you don't like to use the word Jew, you just say the same thing that you would say about Jews. You know, Zionists murder Christian children and use their blood to make matzah. Not Jews, not Jews. Zionists do that. If you just say Zionists somehow, you're exempt from being called a bigot. Not on this show. Not on this show. Zelensky and his neo-Nazi military are killing the citizens of Ukraine to make Russia look like the bad guy. Total false flag. The New World Order is pissed at Putin because he won't join and now buy his country's oil payments. Putin is saying F to all the fake American dollars. I say good for you, Putin, for standing up to the Nazi globalists. Why are you watching my show? Are you sadists? Why are you watching my show? Why are you writing to me? I don't know. First time I've seen your podcast. It's wonderful to hear your take on the UN, Zelensky, and everything else related. I have also read the crazy accusations people post, and it's deeply disturbing to me. What is true and what is not, thanks for shining a light on the absurdity of these posts. And I'm going to continue to do that. Here's an interesting question. This is actually an interesting question. It's uh, obviously biased in some way, but it's interesting, and it's really worthy of discussion. When Ukrainian citizens, by which he means civilians, when Ukrainian citizens take up arms against Russian invaders, doesn't that make them combatants and thus provide an excuse to Russians to claim they are legitimate military targets? Obviously, killing young children is a clear war crime. No, you, you make a very, very good point. When civilians become involved, in defending their country against an aggressive war, they do become legitimate military targets. And targeting them, the specific ones who took up arms against Russia, is not a war crime. But you can't generalize. You can't say since some civilians took up arms against Russia that suddenly all civilians are targets. Obviously, the ones in the train station weren't taking up arms. They were heading away from the battlefield, away from where the um, uh, bad activities were taking place, the war was taking place, and they were targeted. So that clearly is a war crime. Final question. Alan, could you share with us who your role models were growing up in your life? Mine were Jimmy Stewart and Paul Harvey. Uh, thanks, uh, Simplify. Well, you know, Jimmy Stewart was one of mine, especially when, when he did uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. But I had a criticism of To Kill a Mockingbird. He wasn't at To Kill a Mockingbird? Who was at To Kill a Mockingbird? Uh, it wasn't Jimmy Stewart. It was the other guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jimmy Stewart was the rabbit guy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So he's still my hero. But let me finish my point. To Kill a Mockingbird, whoever was in it, um, he, um, um, uh, he defended an innocent guy. The guy was innocent. He didn't do it. Imagine if To Kill a Mockingbird were to have ended up with him defending a guilty murderer, a rapist, or a robber. 
it wouldn't have been a popular book. So that's my criticism of To Kill a Mockingbird. And that was my criticism of now Justice Judge Jackson when she basically said, no, 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 look, I, I didn't voluntarily defend the Guantanamo defendants or other defendants. I was just doing my job. I, I had a job and I worked for the public defender and they made me do it. And I worked for a law firm and they made me do it. No, no, no. You have to, if you're a real lawyer, you have to defend people, whether they're guilty or innocent, whether they're being unfairly prosecuted or fairly prosecuted. So that's my take. And Gregory see you back Peck. here. Gregory Peck. Gregory Peck was in To Kill a Mockingbird. So he was my hero. I actually met him. I actually met Gregory Peck when my son's movie, Reversal of Fortune, won an Oscar for the best actor, Jeremy Irons. We ended up sitting at a table with Gregory Peck, To Kill a Mockingbird. I loved it. It was terrific. So uh, most of my heroes, however, didn't come from the movies. Uh, Jackie Robinson was probably my biggest hero because I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And if an African-American man could make it to second base for the Brooklyn Dodgers, a Jewish kid from Borough Park could do anything. So Jackie Robinson was my main hero. See you tomorrow. Thanks for the correction. One second.